so looking at the post independent uh, india uh, which inherited uh, challenges from the colonial uh, history uh, both in terms of uh, agrarian development uh, uh, land relations uh, a very well entrenched landlord uh, class within the society and uh, also in terms of uh, industrialization and alternative employment opportunities outside agriculture now given these uh, twin challenges uh, the task that was cut out for the independent uh, Indian state was to of course uh, release uh, agriculture and its productive forces from the clutches of uh, landlordism, uh, change or transform the feudal relations that uh, existed uh, agrarian production and to also undertake uh, uh, industrialization process uh, outside the capitalist uh, colonial circuit uh, given that uh, India was not really a isolated uh, economy even during colonial period it had strong linkages with industrialization that was happening elsewhere but uh, it was part of the international division of labor where it was largely a supplier of uh, raw materials and other primary products including food uh, grains towards the industrial uh, centers and uh, as far as industrialization in the Indian subcontinent itself is concerned it was quite limited uh, there were signs of uh, initial signs of modern industry towards the late period of uh, uh, of, colo of, the, of the of colonization but of course it was clearly inadequate uh, given that it employed a negligible share of the workforce and uh, in undertaking or addressing this the twin challenges uh, uh, what was of course required was a certain degree of uh, decoupling from the international trade uh, relations international trade circuit which does not necessarily mean uh, autarky or a closed economy but it essentially means to transform the historical trade relations within which India was part and uh, also introduce a planned economy uh, which would try to uh, not only address the challenges of agriculture and industry separately but also uh, explore the linkages between uh, the agrarian development and the industrial development uh, that uh, were attempted. So given this uh, if you look at uh, the program uh, that the Indian state and also the uh, ruling a political party, the Indian National Congress, uh, which uh, of course uh, formed the government uh, after independence. Some of the major agendas, uh, which of course are drawn from the colonial struggles itself, was to abolish landlordism and undertake a redistribution of land. Uh, based on the slogan of uh, land to the tiller uh, and the other idea which was there again in the report of the Congress party's uh, agrarian reform committee of 1949 was to not only distribute land to the peasants of the actual tillers of the soil but to explore the possibilities of uh, organizing agriculture uh, on a on the principles of village based cooperatives. Now what we find over the 50s is of course a very mixed experience of uh, as far as uh, the implementation of land reforms is concerned. Uh, mixed experience might be a much more optimistic uh, statement that I am making because uh, it was a poor implementation of land reforms that actually took place uh, in the in the Indian subcontinent and and of course in India now uh, given that we have had partition during independence into three different countries the poor implementation of land reforms uh, of course did not have uh, much to do with the actual land reform law although they were 
loopholes within the law itself but largely one finds that as far as the class alliances uh, that existed within the Indian society the government officials who were responsible for the implementation of land reforms which essentially mean, meant uh, confiscation of ceiling surplus law uh, land that is all land which is above the ceiling which has been determined by the land reform law and then of course identify beneficiaries and distribute the land. Not really a very difficult task because as far as agrarian production was concerned it was already a tenant based cultivation and uh, so it's not very difficult to really uh, identify the beneficiaries who are already cultivating who, who would be expectedly those who are already cultivating the land. Of course there can be minor disputes regarding that as well uh, but it was not a task which was undoable at all. What really posed a barrier to really uh, to, to execute the land reforms uh, was the alignment of government officials with the interest of the landed classes. Several kinds of uh, evidence stories can be uh, gathered uh, during that time where uh, landlords uh, or landowners with large amounts of ceiling surplus land would uh, modify the property rights of the land or the titles of the land and hold it in the names of their different family members including children and sometimes also in the name of their pets, cats and dogs in order to avoid the land ceiling laws. So the land ceiling laws were uh, bypassed or circumvented by uh, basically forging the records of who holds the land. Much of this was also buttressed uh, by the fact or strengthened uh, by the fact that the political class alliance uh, which was represented by the ruling political party uh, which was the major party at that point of time except of course the left parties the communist parties the political class alliance essentially represented a bourgeois landlord class alliance uh, alliance between the bourgeoisie which is based in the urban areas who of course are the initiators of the modern industry even in the colonial period and the landlord classes which dominated the rural countryside. And this bourgeois landlord class alliance uh, is of course not something that uh, emerges after independence. It is actually something which had already started in some senses. It was one stream of uh, movement within the larger freedom struggle which was entrenched within the ruling congress party. Of course within the colonial struggles you had peasant movements, you had uh, uh, naval revolts, you had workers movements, so there are different streams of movements but the bourgeois landlord class alliance can also be held as one component uh, of that uh, colonial struggle and this alliance actually gets strengthened within the congress party uh, after independence. So over the 50s uh, while in the 1949 report talked about radical land redistribution and village based cooperative over the 50s there was a continuous debate within the congress party as to what is the correct path of uh, agrarian development and uh, in its uh, Nagpur session of 1959 that is towards the end of the 50s in the Nagpur session of the Congress, the resolution on agri agricultural organizational pattern, which essentially was proposing this idea of land reforms and cooperatives, was defeated in the, uh, within the Congress party. And that of course is the end of the, officially marks the end of the land reform agenda of the Indian state. That does not mean that land reforms did not happen after that, but it happened as part of a different political correlation where the left uh, uh, 
organize movements based on land and as well as for uh, there were significant food movements in the 1960s. Now this meant that uh, the official abandoning of the land reforms uh, agenda and the restructuring or reorganization of uh, agricultural production in India essentially meant that there were significant constraints which emerged or which, which uh, actually intensified for the industrialization process. <clears throat> Again, if you look at the history of the planning process in India, it is the second five-year plan which, uh, uh, in fact, many scholars argue that that was really the only plan where substantial planning had been done and uh, planning as a process also kind of uh, waned away in the later uh, period. But the second five-year plan uh, essentially chalked out a, a strategy of industrialization based on heavy industries which uh, uh, look at the question of building infrastructure, uh, creating uh, manufacturing intermediate goods, uh, machinery, uh, both for industries as well as for agriculture. And uh, of course, uh, put substantial uh, funds into that kind of a project. There were multiple cooperations with different countries, uh, both the Soviet Union as well as uh, Britain, the US, and uh, particularly for a uh, uh, number of steel plants that came up all across the uh, country. Simultaneously, the heavy industrial industrialization or the heavy industry strategy was supposed to be accompanied by uh, light manufacturing uh, industries, the growth of light manufacturing industries, certain industries which were already existing like the cotton textile uh, chemical industries, but also uh, pharmaceuticals uh, and, uh, and, and of course uh, to some extent an automobile industry, but that was largely again state owned, not so much of a private industry at that stage of point uh, in the, that stage of history. Now the constraints in terms of uh, creating a market for these industrial goods intensified given that there was no radical re land redistribution uh, which, which could have created more equality in the rural countryside, uh, reversing some of the experiences of the colonial trend and uh, could have also uh, created that market which was required for industrial development. And the other major concern or constraint that emerged in the 60s was of course that of food shortages. And there were severe food shortages uh, in the early 60s uh, within India uh, leading to very strong food movements across uh, both in the urban areas as well as in the uh, suburbs. And uh, the situation was as uh, stark as that India was uh, dependent on the US uh, consignment of wheat aid, the, which is popularly called the PL 480, which used to arrive at the port and uh, it was basically said that India lived from the ship to the mouth. So the grains were unloaded from the ships, the US uh, ships that arrived with these wheat consignments and it was directly sent to the markets. Now in that uh, situation, I mean before going on further as to what happens beyond the mid 60s, you also find a parallel uh, discourse that exists within the uh, Indian continent and again not in all parts of India, but primarily wherever the left uh, forces were strong enough to organize the peasants for the demand of land. And in the late 50s, even as the Congress party was giving up on the agenda of land reforms, you find that uh, in the southern state of Kerala, there is a strong communist movement which uh, is again based on the question of uh, land uh, distribution to the peasants. And uh, the first communist government was uh, elected in India in 1957 in Kerala. Of course, it's another matter that uh, the Indian state used a certain constitutional provision to dismiss that government in, in a year, uh, citing law and order problems and other kinds of things. But nevertheless, it still meant that the peasants were very strongly organized uh, behind the uh, land movement. Over the 60s and the 70s, uh, you find that in certain corners of the country, particularly in Kerala, which uh, of course uh, already the communists were strong, 
and also in the eastern part uh, in the state of West Bengal uh, there were strong land movements uh, different uh, factions of the Communist Party all organizing peasants uh, uh, on the demand for uh, getting the right over land on the on the basis of the slogan of land to the tiller and uh, it meant that even as the state did not pursue with the land reforms movement at the societal level in the particularly in the rural societies there were strong movements and strong capturing of land uh, by the peasants who are actually cultivating the land uh, evicting landlords uh, were happening under the leadership of these different communist parties much of this was of course declared as illegal uh, often there was a conflict between the state and the peasants uh, on the question of land as a result of this. Uh, the 60s were also a period, uh, unfortunately, which uh, led to serious divisions within the communist movement as well, uh, which uh, was based on, uh, of course, uh, one was the China question uh, as to uh, whether it was India which uh, uh, entered China or whether it was China which invaded uh, India and uh, of course uh, one faction within the Communist Party was arguing for peaceful dialogue between India and China and against war and the other faction of course uh, was more nationalistic and that of course led to a division of the Communist parties in 1964 and then there was a subsequent division of uh, the CPI Marxist into two factions, one of course remained the CPI Marxist and the other uh, which led to the Naxal Badi uh, movement in again late 1960s on the question of uh, uh, whether land reforms can be accommodated within the rules and the games of, uh, of the Indian constitution of the Indian state or whether one needs to really go for a more violent uh, revolution. So more on the question of tactics, but of course, uh, which was backed up by theoretical differences in understanding. Nevertheless, in spite of these divisions, the 60s actually saw a very strong uh, land movement. It uh, therefore meant that uh, over the 70s, uh, particularly with uh, a uh, left-leaning government coming into power in Kerala again and in the late 70s a uh, left front government coming into power in Bengal much of the land redistribution which was happening uh, unofficially illegally uh, was regularized or given uh, within the land reform laws was recognized and uh, of course there are certain differences between the land reform uh, policies that were actually uh, undertaken or the approach that were undertaken between Bengal and Kerala. In Kerala, all kinds of tenancy were banned. So the focus largely was on distribution of land to the tillers and any kind of tenancy rights uh, of course was not the, uh, uh, not in the emphasis. In contrast, in Bengal uh, as part of the operation Bar Barga, uh, the emphasis was more on securing uh, the tenancy rights uh, of the cultivators on the land and securing the tenancy rights for a longer period of time uh, where, whereby laws were passed which said that if a tenant is cultivating the land for a period of uh, uh, 7 years to 12 years they cannot be evicted arbitrarily by the landlord. So you basically get a paper from the government uh, which uh, ensures your tenancy rights, which secures your tenancy rights and this was felt as uh, important uh, for uh, undertaking improvements in agriculture, uh, undertaking uh, development of uh, the land and the other things. Uh, the share of the tenants in the output was also stipulated at, at two third, which was if you look at the colonial period. Uh, the power of the landlord classes essentially ensured that the tenants would get only around one third or even less of the output that was produced. Two third, anywhere between half to two third of the output was collected by the landlord as rent. So that was something that was reversed by the Operation uh, Burger. 
there was of course uh, a certain degree of land redistribution as well uh, but the tenancy reforms component you don't find in Kerala. On the other hand in Kerala one of the drawbacks uh, of the land reform uh, that happened and uh, those conflicts are coming out uh, now in contemporary uh, Kerala which is that uh, the plantation sector uh, Kerala again has a large plantation sector where you grow rubber, spices, coconuts, different kinds of. The plantation sector was largely held or kept outside the land reforms, uh, the scope of the land reforms program, which meant that uh, the concentration of land, if you take the plantation sector into account, was still quite high. And uh, today, and 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 the, and the logic behind uh, uh, that was, of course, much of the plantation sector was organized on industrial lines, so it was not considered an agricultural uh, sector per se. The conflict uh, that you find in contemporary Kerala at several places is between uh, the workers who work in the plantation sector in the plantation-based industries, the trade unions and uh, more of uh, indigenous population or peasant population who are settling down on plantation land. And the trade unions of course think that this is an encroachment of the plantation land whereas it's a demand for home, house and, uh, and uh, uh, homestead land which is also coming up from other sections of the non-industrial uh, population. Nevertheless, uh, one can still say that there was relatively successful land reforms in these two part of the country, again led by the left. There was also some unevenness within the Congress uh, ruled states as well because in one southern Indian state of uh, Karnataka you find that there was significant degree of land reforms. Uh, and also in Jammu and Kashmir, of course again ruled by a different uh, political alliance. Uh, but largely in most part of the country, you do not find any change in uh, land distribution. In fact, uh, if we look at the overall trend of land concentration for a long period, uh, right from the 50s or the early 60s to the, big, to the end of the uh, last uh, century, you actually find that uh, there is not much change as far as land distribution is concerned. So if you look at from 1960s up to 2000 uh, or, or maybe till 1991-92, we can deal with the last period uh, separately in the next lecture given that that is also a period of neoliberal economic ref reforms. You find that uh, the bottom 60 percent of the households in the rural areas uh, in 61-62 had a share of around 10.8 percent and that by 91-92 was still around 11 uh, percent. Of course, what is to be noted is that because of generational, intergenerational division of land driven by patrilineal organization of agriculture, the land size, the average land size of course has gone down uh, over these years. But if you distribute, uh, look at the distribution across households and not by size classes, then of course you can compare over the longer period. The top 10 percent uh, had 51.5 percent of the land in uh, agricultural land uh, in the rural areas in 61-62 it's still 51 by 91-92. So this essentially meant that whatever little land reforms might have happened in areas where the left had more influence or whether the Congress party was more left leaning because the Congress party again had different uh, streams of uh, thought which was accommodated. Uh, it actually was compensated by increasing land concentration in other parts of the country. So the limited land reforms do not even show up on the national data as any significant change in the land distribution. In fact, uh, uh, if you, uh, I mean parallelly when militant struggles for land was uh, going on uh, within India in some parts, uh, there was also a parallel movement which was started by a Gandhian, uh, Vinoba Bhave, which was called the Bhudan movement. Bhu means land in uh, Urdu or Hindi again and Dan means that you donate. 
So basically, there was a peaceful or pacificatory appeal uh, by Bhave uh, calling on the landlords to voluntarily donate land uh, for uh, so that so that poor peasants could get access to land and all of that. Which, of course, needless to say that it uh, hardly had any major impact uh, in terms of uh, changing the land distribution. Uh, in fact, the militant struggles did succeed in uh, altering land distributions within certain parts of the country, but overall for the whole Indian uh, nation, you don't find any kind of impact on land concentration. Now, the crisis of the 60s, coming back to the question of food shortages and the constraints for industrialization, the crisis of the early 60s meant that uh, something had to be done uh, in order to take forward the developmental question and uh, to increase the productivity of agriculture, which of course, uh, as I explained, the as far as the agenda of social reform or land reform was concerned, that was officially abandoned uh, by the late 60s. So, what is the new path that you can uh, adopt to undertake that task? And that is where you have the experience of the Green Revolution coming in uh, from the mid 60s. Some say that it was not so much about uh, a planned strategy, but it was more in desperation, given that uh, in the 19 64, the PL 480 wheat consignments from the US actually stopped coming because of some diplomatic uh, problems between India and, uh, and uh, the US. And that essentially meant that something very immediately had to be done to address the uh, food question. And uh, coincident coincidentally, it is at the same point that the US scientist Norman Borlaug is uh, uh, presenting his uh, high yielding variety seeds and that is the technology that finds its way into India. You do not have immediate impact of the green revolution technology in the 60s, but you can see the effect of that from the 70s onwards. So, you essentially abandon the agenda. So, what really happens during this period is that you, you abandon the agenda of altering land relations and releasing the productive forces of the peasantry. On the other hand, you take a, adopt a technocratic or a technological route of using high yielding variety seeds, uh, which are chemical intensive uh, in, in nature uh, and it also requires uh, more water for cultivating. So, higher doses of chemical fertilizers, pesticides and uh, which also means that it has to be water intensive for the plants to absorb these uh, chemical, uh, chemical inputs. But the Green Revolution process was not only a technological uh, route or a technocratic path. It was accompanied by certain institutional reforms which uh, in my view has uh, more important uh, significance, particularly in today's context of neoliberal economic reforms in India. And which was that uh, there was a new uh, food management system which was introduced within the country. Uh, it meant the setting up of the food corporation of India, which would uh, guarantee a procurement price to the farmers, which would guarantee a price support uh, to the farmers, albeit there are critics that that price support essentially got restricted to rice and wheat and of course, I will come to that point at a later point of time and simultaneously setting up the public distribution system, which uh, has the task of uh, distributing subsidized food to the poor through a network of uh, ration shops. This meant that the government in effect uh, provided a subsidy, uh, which is the food subsidy uh, to the population, uh, which is the difference in the price of uh, the, the price that the government pays to the farmers and the price or the issue price at which the food is distributed to the poor and there is a gap between the two. 
the setting up of the public distribution system also meant that there was more governmental reach uh, to backward rural areas. Even today, there are certain backward areas uh, within the rural uh, within rural India where the only government institution is a public distribution uh, system outlet or a ration shop. There's no other. There's no post office. There's no. Uh, bank, there's nothing else uh, in such uh, areas, but that PDS shop, and it performs more functions than just simply distributing food. Uh, uh, the other important uh, institutional reform, which uh, happened again in a situation where the 1960s, uh, I mean, before the in the by the till the 1960s, the banking system was largely private. Again, carrying on from the colonial period, and. Uh, the banking system also went into a crisis. There were serious uh, bank runs uh, which happened in the 60s, which was followed by the nationalization of commercial banks in India in 1969. And the nationalization of commercial banks along with the uh, policy of uh, priority sector credit meant that uh, there was a provision that a certain proportion of the credit that is disbursed by the banks have to go to agriculture and to small and medium enterprises and at certain subsidized interest uh, rates. The provisioning of uh, institutional farm credit therefore was the other important uh, reform that took place as part of these uh, policy changes during this period. And we look at what impact that had uh, some data on that. There were investments in irrigation, again, controversial to some extent, given that it led to the development of big dams, which also meant large scale displacement of people. But there are sections within the uh, farmers or the peasantry who are also in favor of uh, getting, I mean, building of these canals which provide. Uh, water, which is now required for the water intensive farming technology that has been introduced. And research, agricultural research to develop newer and newer varieties of seeds and extension services which are provided so that farmers can adopt that uh, technology. So, large expenditures, public expenditures on setting up agricultural universities, uh, uh, agricultural research centers, the Indian Council of Agricultural Research was uh, made more uh, stronger and extension services uh, that were provided to farmers. So, we will look at some data as to what it uh, did to the agricultural sector and then we will get back to questions about what it meant for agrarian development and uh, whether it was a peasant path or whether it was a landlord driven path, we will look at that question. Now, the agricultural growth rate uh, again in the early first 15 years after independence uh, was of course uh, around 2.5 percent. You can find that with the immediate introduction of the green revolution in the 1960, middle of the 1960s, as far as the overall agricultural or the primary sector growth rate is concerned, you do not find much difference uh, in that. The reason being that the green revolution was regionally very restricted and there were other regions within the country which were actually not only not benefiting from the green revolution in this period in the between 65 and 80, but were actually still in a condition of stagnation, agrarian stagnation. It is only in the 80s that you really find that there is a some kind of a break where the agricultural growth rate actually increases to uh, 3.5 percent. And if you look at the regional data on growth again it is divided into the northwestern region, the eastern, central and southern region. Uh, in the initial period it was largely the green revolution technology again was biased more in favor of wheat. Uh, the rice component came in much later and uh, which meant that it was restricted to the wheat growing areas which is in the north and the north. So, it is the state of Punjab, the state of Haryana, parts of uh, Uttar Pradesh, which actually experienced high growth in agriculture during this period. But at the same time, there are other areas, particularly if you look at the eastern region, uh, 
between 70 and 80, the eastern region actually has a growth rate of agriculture of just 1%. This is virtually stagnation. In West Bengal, it, I mean, it's again Jim Boyce's famous paper, Agrarian Ompas in Bengal, actually points out to this that the growth rate in agriculture was virtually close to zero during this period. But this is also the period where the land struggles are going on. The major break comes in when you in the in the 80s when you find that the green revolution technology often sometimes backed up by the distribution of land particularly in areas like Bengal which suddenly leads to a accelerated rate of small or petty capital accumulation investments on small investments in land private investments undertaken by peasants who have been newly secured in terms of their tenancy and the growth rate also kind of jumps and this is when the green revolution is actually also going into rise. Parts of southern Indian states also join the uh, high growth uh, regime and that meant that uh, the 80s were actually the period when there was some impact of the green revolution but it's practically the beginning of some agrarian development again in what sense we'll discuss that uh, after we look at this data it meant uh, that uh, there was uh, increase these are some data on consumption of fertilizers chemical fertilizers again there was massive increase in chemical fertilizer use in agriculture in the 1960 early 1960s you can see that the consumption of fertilizers kilograms per hectare was less than 10 kilograms in most of the states except maybe Kerala and Tamil Nadu and that increased massively in say Punjab or in the Haryana over the period. For the eastern region again the increase is happening in the 80s so by 1992 95 you find that chemical agriculture has really taken over uh, similarly in other uh, areas. What also happened is that uh, with growing irrigation uh, and state support for irrigation the cropping intensity also increased uh, over the period. So land is increasingly being cultivated two times or sometimes even three times depending on the geographical location of the land. Now what all of this uh, meant uh, if we have to assess it uh, for from the point of view of social change or agrarian change it meant uh, two things uh, we need to look at some of the criticisms of the green revolution in order to understand what was the characteristic of the uh, changing agrarian relations first uh, the green revolution uh, was it was claimed that this kind of chemical intensive water intensive uh, cultivation is scale neutral that is you can do it on small pieces of land it does not matter what size of land you are holding but it can be done with the sharing of some inputs like uh, tractors and all of that but definitely it was not resource neutral uh, in terms of uh, affordability of higher volumes of uh, chemical fertilizers which you buy from the market uh, large sections of the peasantry were not immediately able to afford uh, uh, irrigation facilities, power, although there are subsidies and all of that but you still need some kind of investments to actually start it. So the green revolution policies or the institutional reforms were largely captured by the rich peasants to begin with and of course the landlords themselves some of the landlords getting transferred into transformed into capitalist uh, landlords evicting the tenants and undertaking cultivation themselves and this only happens in a certain situation where the profitability of agriculture goes up uh, given the state support but it's not entirely market driven because it's driven the pri there's a price guarantee given by the state and there is input subsidy which is also given by the state now that meant that there was the emergence of uh, capitalist landlords and rich peasants and uh, which still 
scholars like Byers and Utsa Patnaik have still characterized it as a peasant path of uh, capitalist development in agriculture. The reason being that even the big farmers uh, in the Indian context were still not really very big when you compared it with, uh, with the capitalist uh, development of agriculture or land holdings in the north or even in, uh, in, the, in the Latin American continent. I mean, they're still tiny holdings, even the biggest farms in Punjab and all of that. At the same time, uh, there was a growing increase in landlessness with some eviction and, and of course, uh, requirement of labor uh, for this kind of a capitalist uh, agriculture. In the 60s and the 70s, uh, there were a number of scholars, including uh, scholars from abroad and a large number of Indian scholars actually engaged in trying to understand what is the mode of production in Indian agriculture and what are the changes that are happening. There was one stream of thought, very early literature, which declared that Indian agriculture was already capitalist at the time of independence. There were two variables which uh, they largely looked at. One is uh, what is the marketed surplus? What is the amount of output which is sold in the markets? And uh, the share of agricultural labors in the rural countryside, in the amongst the rural population. Now, both actually, both factors actually show very high figures. Uh, and that's not only at the time of independence, but even in the last phase of colonial period. The reason being that uh, Indian agriculture was already well integrated in the world export markets. So, marketing the output was not something that only happens or starts happening after independence, but it's something they're already integrated in the capitalist trading networks. But that necessarily did not lead to development of agriculture, given that peasants were left with very little subsistence or practically no investable funds to improve the agricultural output. And the other uh, conundrum or uh, peculiarity of, uh, about the Indian agricultural case is that the share of uh, agricultural labors in rural population was as high as 30 percent, 31 percent uh, to be precise, right in the 1930s. Now, this was actually comparable to some of the developed countries like Sweden and uh, UK and uh, other countries where the share of. But one needs to realize that these are not necessarily capitalist wage laborers. They are more unfree labor, which has emerged from the long colonial operation of extracting land revenues from the agricultural sector which has reduced peasants to tenants and uh, finally to unfree labor or bonded labor. And that is what is actually showing up in the census uh, data when the surveys were done, something that we explained also in the last uh, lecture. So therefore, uh, some scholars like Utsa Patnaik argued that it is not enough uh, to look at these two variables of uh, selling, I mean, interaction with the market and the incidence of wage labor or the incidence of agricultural labor, the two variables do not give us sufficient conclusions, do not allow us to make uh, conclusions about whether the Indian agriculture is capitalist or not. But you need to look at something else. And she argued that what you need to look at additionally for colonial countries and colonial countries like India to understand whether there is some capitalist uh, tendency in agriculture or not, is to look at uh, what is the amount or the share of the surplus which comes back as investments on the lands. Even if they are in absolute terms small investments, but nevertheless what is the tendency of investments in land. And uh, she, of course, uh, started off her analysis with a skepticism that there is any capitalist uh, 
about any capitalist uh, tendencies existing in Indian agriculture, but through her field work of big farms, she actually came to the conclusion that although we cannot say that there, I mean, Indian agriculture is capitalist, but there are certain capitalist tendencies which are emerging, largely driven by the state policies and the industrial policies that are being undertaken. The other stream of thought, again in the mode of production debate, uh, was contesting this perspective, is also coming from a different part of the country, which is the eastern part of the country. Scholars like Amit Bhaduri, Nirmal Chandra, essentially argue that Indian agriculture is largely characterized by semi-feudal production relations. And there is no uh, tendency of capitalist penetration. So, practically rejecting the peasant path of capitalist development. Now, if you look at the evidence that they present, uh, it's actually very interesting because this is again a field work done uh, in the state of Bihar in eastern part of India, which of course, as you find is not really being affected by the green revolution technologies in the 70s, maybe just uh, beginning to so show some signs in the 80s, but it's definitely a backward agriculture. And uh, Bhaduri found and which has been, his study has been, I'm mentioning him because his study has been one of the major uh, academic resources for the whole uh, left position which thought that, which, which some of it still sticks to the analysis that Indian uh, countryside or Indian agrarian relations are characterized by a semi-feudal relations, shows that uh, there is some kind of an interlocking of markets, which is the land or interlocking, instead of saying interlocking of markets, a more appropriate uh, terminology would be interlocking of different kinds of social relations, land relations, credit relations, labor relations all inter interlocked with each other. I found that in some of these, uh, in, in Bihar as well as in some parts of Bengal, uh, the tenant cultivator actually uh, was perpetually indebted in terms of being able to meet their subsistence requirements. So, at the beginning of every, if you imagine production cycles of, uh, of seasons of agriculture, at the beginning or prior to, uh, to sowing their lands, they would be forced to take consumption loans from the landlords or from the landowners. And these consumption loans then are crucial for the survival of the peasants throughout the sowing season. And it is only after the harvesting, after they have grown the crops, grown the food grains, that they can repay back the consumption loans. The interesting aspect of what Bhaduri found was that when the tenants actually took the consumption loans from the landlords, these are lean seasons, when the food grain supplies in the markets are very low and the price of grains are usually high. So the valuation of the loan is made according to that price. So maybe one bag of rice priced at let's say one dollar, I'm just for understanding. when they are repaying the loans after the harvest, typically as it happens in an agricultural season, the prices immediately after harvest are much lower. So the one bag of rice is no more the value of one dollar, but it has probably come down to 0.33 dollars. This meant that the tenant, when they pay back the consumption loan, they actually have to pay back three bags of rice to pay off a loan of one dollar. 
which meant that you borrowed one bag of rice and you paid back three bags of rice. And this was the system which was existing in large parts of uh, Bengal, particularly where he did the survey. And he said that as a result of this, the, the own rate of interest, uh, that the rate of interest, the implicit rate of interest that the money lender was collecting was often 200 percent at the extreme. Of course, he said that 200 percent was this one bag, three bag example that he gave in his uh, writing on his paper. He said that that's the extreme example. But at all points of time, the interest rate that the tenant ended up paying through this consumption loan cycle was never less than 60 percent. And it could be anywhere between 60 percent to 200 percent. He gives in a, he says in a footnote in that paper that he actually wondered and also asked some of the tenants that why don't you reverse the cycle? Why don't you borrow or take the loans in, because you know that you are going to, you have a lower share of subsistence and you are going to run out of your food grains by the end of the year. Why don't you take the loans in advance when the prices are low and pay back maybe when the prices are high, in that way it can be reversed. But that is where power relations come in the, as far as the rural area is concerned. I mean, the simple answer to that is that nobody is willing to lend us or give us consumption loan when there's immediately after harvest when prices are low and when there's plenty of uh, food grains uh, in the market. So in a sense, the rural power relations between the landlord and the tenant essentially force the tenants to take loans only when uh, the prices of uh, rice was high. So studying, I mean observing this kind of a relationship between, I mean the, the hierarchy in terms of land ownership, the credit relation that emerges again between the landowner and the, and the tenant and of course the fact that the labor of the tenant is also appropriated indirectly via the land relations. Bahaduri says that the tenant actually gets perpetually tied to the landlord because you get perpetually indebted. And he basically says that without a significant revolution from the below, uh, this question of course, this exploitation would not uh, be possible to end. Or he says that the other way is of course, uh, if the landlords kind of find some incentive to completely transform into capitalist uh, agriculture, but that according to him was not there, at least in this eastern part of the country. The, this stream of thought also adds certain other, uh, makes certain other points, which is that there was also no escape for these exploited tenant cultivators because of the limited industrialization that was happening which meant that there was not much employment opportunities outside agriculture, that you can escape agriculture and go and escape this exploitative system and go and uh, join a uh, capitalist wage working force. The debate on the mode of production of the literature actually notes, of course, that there are both tendencies and the agrarian question actually or the agrarian change was very uneven in nature across different parts of the country. But there was some consensus towards the end of the debate on the argument or on the position that the green revolution technologies along with the state policies essentially imposed or superimposed some kind of capitalist relations where investments are taking place, uh, input intensive cultivation is uh, progressing, but it has been imposed on feudal social relations. Because as we noted that the land reforms or changing in land relations were abandoned much earlier. So typically like, uh, I mean again if we go back to the debate or the question of the emergence of capitalism and the, the role of the agrarian question or rural countryside in that, in many cases you find that uh, even if it is not always a confrontational politics, but there is a conflict between 
capitalist farmers and feudal landlords. Particularly in the case of Europe, you can imagine that it's long conflicts that take place, finally transforming the agrarian relations. Now, in the case of India, you find that there is emergence of rich farmers or rich peasants who are who are, who are exploiting labor, labor of other peasant uh, classes. But they are not in any fundamental conflict with the erstwhile landlord classes. So there is an emergence of capitalist farmers from below, to use T.J. Byers' uh, terminology again, more of the peasant path. But they don't really enter into a conflict with the capitalist landlords. So Gail Omvet, who is a sociologist, who basically comes at a much later point in the debate and says that it is meaningless to debate any further whether Indian agriculture is characterized by capitalist economic relations or not, because she says that it is capitalist. I mean, they're interacting with the market and, and of course, they're exploiting labor. So you can find all the ingredients of capitalist agriculture in Indian in, in Indian countryside. But nevertheless, that kind of a transformation in economic relationships do not necessarily lead to any social change. It does not lead to any social transformation in the way the society is organized. The society still remains embroiled in largely feudal kind of a relationship. And the reason being is many of the rich farmers who emerged as capitalist farmers, many of the rich peasants who emerged as increasingly were emerging as capitalist farmers, are of the same caste as the landlords. And again, given that rural countryside, the institution of caste is very important, and that is where conflicts or alliances are made based on that institution, it was not possible that, or it was not incumbent that the rich farmers or the capitalist farmers who emerge from below will enter into any conflict with the erstwhile traditional landlords. Now that is largely true. I think that's a quite a valid observation for many parts of the country. At the same time, you also find exceptions to this in some parts. Not so much through state reforms or land reforms, but more through market processes, where in certain parts of the country you find that some of the backward classes, for example, the Yadavs in Bihar or UP, Uttar Pradesh, the Yadavs actually through market processes did manage to buy out more land over a certain length of period, which also meant that there were new political parties some of the Janta parties which emerged, the socialist parties which emerged, had the base of these parties where political parties were basically these newly emerging landed castes, who were traditionally backward classes. So there is some change in land relations that also happen across castes. But it is, in my view, limited uh, and restricted to only certain uh, areas. Traditional landed classes still largely were able to hold on to their land. But of course, they are transformed to a large degree. If you observe a landed uh, uh, farmer in uh, the 80s, and if you try to compare them with one in 50s or in the colonial period, you of course will find that the economic motivation or the economic logic by which they operate their land or use their land is to a significant extent different many of them are actually undertaking cultivation themselves using hired labor. However, there is a caveat here, which is that they have undergone this change under a certain state regime, which is the price guarantee and the input subsidy regime that was introduced, which has kept their profitability at a high level, which is why it creates an incentive to shift to own cultivation. Green revolution technology or high yielding variety seeds were also adopted largely across different size classes of farms eventually. Because, I mean, it became less and less uh, resource intensive. 
if that regime changes, if that regime of high profitability which is largely uh, backed up by state policies, if that changes, if the conditions of agriculture, the economic conditions of agriculture changes, there is always a possibility that the old landlordism can make a comeback, where landlords find that it is more suitable to actually lease out your land to tenants and go back to tenant cultivation and extract rent as much as possible. Given that the social change or the social relations of exploitation did not really disappear from the countryside. So you can always go back to, I mean the power relations are always there, it is because of the economic incentives provided by the state that you are behaving in a different way as far as the use of land is concerned. If those incentives disappear, there is always a possibility that you can, you might change. Now, what is the overall assessment in the, towards the late 80s or the early 90s as to where Indian agriculture stands and where agrarian change uh, stands? And I'll end with that. A couple of things. One is it has been noted that uh, the price guarantee system or the state policies that were introduced for supporting in agriculture, much of it is petty commodity production including the largest of the farmers on a larger global capitalist scale is severely restricted. It ended up becoming more of a rice and wheat policy. There was lack of any clear biodiversity policy in the thinking of the state, which meant that one of, much of the traditional cereals which were grown, which are coarse cereals, not very good in terms of uh, probably look or taste, but which are equally nutritious as rice and wheat. Much of those coarse cereals actually started disappearing because of this price incentive that was given to rice and wheat. And also what emerged was monocultures of rice in areas which are not suitable for rice cultivation particularly in the northern plains. And this meant that there were significant environmental implications, uh, water tables uh, going down, creating uh, difficulties for even practicing any other agriculture. So those are some kind of distortions which it was noted that needs to be corrected. Otherwise it would lead to long term uh, ecological problems. Second it essentially meant that it's covering largely, I mean again the procurement operations that the government did in terms of its uh, food grain uh, procurement, the government operations were largely restricted to four or five states or four or five provinces. Large part of the provinces still did not get direct benefit of procurement because they were either left out or they were growing other crops which the rice wheat kind of policy did not uh, cover. As far as commercial crops are concerned, there were marketing boards which were set up with of course uneven coverage which need, needed to be deepened in order to support more and more small farmers and marginal farmers. Similarly for food grains. So a deepening and diversification of the state policies or the state procurement operations essentially was required. The second important trend uh, that also need uh, could be noted at towards the late 80s is that public investment in agricultural research or extension services or irrigation was still there, but it had already started showing a declining trend from the 80s, which meant that the first point that was noted that is deepening of support, government support for supporting petty commodity producers in other parts of the country which are not yet getting support. It would be difficult to do that if public investment in agriculture and associated activities are actually going down. So these are noted of course as challenges which needed to be undertaken from the 90s onwards. 
what we actually have, what we have in reality in terms of a policy direction is completely different or radically different, where you go towards a more free market oriented approach, a more an approach where you ask farmers to compete in the markets and with the neoliberal economic re reforms, there are different kinds of other reforms which also adversely affect the agricultural sector like banking reforms which reduce the credit flow for, uh, for the farmers and the peasants and particularly again you find that it is the small marginal farmers who start getting excluded. So, there are multiple impacts, I mean multiple policies and multiple impacts uh, on the agricultural sector which happen in the, uh, in the, in the what we call the neoliberal period of, uh, of the Indian economy uh, from the 90s and which we shall discuss in the next lecture.